Like we're kind of ready, ready to kick this off here. Uh, so all right, last session of the day. Uh, this is going to be very code heavy. I'm going to go into like the code I use to do various things, and I'll try to keep it fun, but it's a lot of code. So, but publishing and managing modules in a internal repository. So first, why am I talking about this? Uh, I've worked in several PowerShell environments. I think my largest PowerShell environment, we probably had 30 some internal modules, uh, 700 some functions across those that we were managing. Uh, we had internally, we were actually open sourcing some modules or so publishing stuff to, you know, to the uh, PS gallery. Uh, I had my own personal modules being used internally. We had some open source stuff that we were modifying, but we couldn't wait for a pull request to get merged, so we needed to have that version of the module in our environment, right? And then we also had about 18 or so just general modules from the community that we were using internally, excluding, you know, like the AZ and AWS monster, you know, largest, largest uh, uh, module. So I had a pretty complex matrix of things I was supporting and managing and keeping track of. So, but how do you distribute PowerShell? Like that's, that's the age old question, right? Email, actually no, no, <laughs> please don't be using email <laughs> to distribute your PowerShell scripts. I mean, uh, attaching those scripts and uh, yeah, that's a zone nightmare, but we've we, we moved beyond that, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but from here, uh, there was a time when USB drives, you know, older teams, we'd put them on a drive and each person would have their tool kit that we'd run to a machine and we'd plug it in on and Oh yeah, I'm glad I don't have to touch physical box servers like that as often now. Uh, then file shares. This one actually has, you know, we can use file shares to like, maybe import modules, like a central spot, or we can go grab stuff and, and pull it down. Uh, but there's some weird nuances on there, and, and the gotcha here is please don't set your PS module path to the file share because you're, you're hitting these IOs across the network every time any commands wants to search for and discover something. So if you do import directly from a file share, import from it, but don't put that in your module path. That's like, if you learn one thing, learn that. So. <laughs> uh, source control. So, you know, if you've got like a Git repo for your team, like if you suggest your team and you're not really sharing your modules outside that or on the servers, this, you can get a lot of mileage out of this, just having a repo that your modules are checked into and you pull them down and get the latest. Um, I would locally put that in my PS module path when, when, I was, when I was doing it that way. And then there's a PowerShell gallery, which is awesome, except you don't want to publish your internal private logic out for the public to eventually find, right? Like that's, that's where I want my code, except I don't want it there. So there's gotta be a way that we can kind of Get that experience for ourselves, right? Like, like, imagine if you had your own PS gal a gallery, right? That's really what this is all about. You can do find module, install module. Uh, they'd be locally installed. And if you dev them right, they'll auto import. So we can get all that fun stuff if we have our own repository. So I'm going to run through uh, some code here. We're going to set up some basic repository with some creating and publishing uh, modules. Uh, I'll talk about NuGet feeds and show um, some items there. Uh, I'm going to walk through publish scripts I've used to publish modules and hosting because uh, I love it if it's just really, really simple, but there are these little edge cases here and there that you start adding and got to work around. So this will be a toolkit for anybody going down this path. I've got a lot of these little gotchas kind of accounted for and some good lessons to learn from. Yes, please do. <laughs> learn from my pain. All right, so I'm gonna start with the most basic repository and actually just publish to like a file share. So current PowerShell get will let you define a UNC path or any location uh, as a repository. Now, I don't have a network uh, right now, so I'm just gonna do my local, local disk, but let's import PowerShell get. Yay, imported, okay. So, PowerShell Get has a handful of commands, and they're actually pretty self-explanatory and fairly intuitive here. Uh, for managing, like we can get, get the repositories, we can register them and, and do all that fun stuff. So, if, uh, uh, I, I do have all this stuff up on, on GitHub, this, the, the source code. 
I do kind of have some of my output in line in the script, just for easy reference, so I don't, you don't necessarily have to run each of these commands. But, all right, so if I get my repository right now, I should only have one. Yes, my demo's in a clean state. Okay, so I've got a PS gallery <laughs> that I can load modules from. Uh, from that, we're gonna register, like I said, a network share. I'm just gonna create a local folder here. So let's actually create this folder because it doesn't exist yet. Boom, we have a location to put stuff. And then, uh, here's my first nuance, that I actually have to have like full paths to a network location, or um, I gotta resolve the path, right? I can't do something relative, so let's, let's actually define my full network share as the full path to wherever it sits at the moment. And then here, here's our basic command register repository. That's actually we give it a name, uh, a source and publish location lets us actually pull from it and publish to it. It needs both those provided. And installation policy trusted because if we don't trust our own code, I don't know who will. <laughs> so let's go ahead and set this monster up. And then if we direct our repository, we can see it listed right there, beautifully trusted. And if I do a find module verbose, you know, it'll try to find something, but ultimately it will find nothing because we haven't published anything yet. It's just an empty folder. All right, so I've got a bare bones module here. There's really the two files that really don't serve much of a purpose other than I can publish it. And we call publish module with just the path and say this is my repository. So now we have published module. Oh boy, okay, there we go. That scared me there for a second. Okay, so we do a find module now. It'll list everything. There's our, there's my, my module. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. Now, what was this guy here for? Oh yeah, we can install from it. So now I install the module from my repository because I'm actually specifying my repository name here in this line. My repository install. It's all beautifully fine. And now if I check my available modules, it's there. Don't you just give the module name? I mean, set up your default sequence of user and module. Um, actually, I haven't yet. So right now I have two, mo I have two repositories. And I'm actually going to separate into that okay. fun of having multiple repositories listed. Um, but if I, all right, okay, so I've installed my module. And if I actually call a function in there, because I properly designed it to export its functions, it'll auto-import when I say get something, and we do. We have whatever this thing does. Okay. Uh, the share now, if we take a peek inside of it, it's actually just a NuGet package. So it's using the same format it's using in the gallery. It's literally just a, a new spec file. Uh, technically, you can rename that zip, open it up, do some exploring in there, but, uh, this is the language that PowerShell get talks when it's, when it's uh, working with modules. So from that, let's look at, okay, so when your environment gets larger or, or sometimes you might wanna have like uh, required, uh, uh, some modules require other modules, right? We've got this property called required modules. So if I pop this thing open, yeah, I can say this module requires this VSO login command. So that when I you know import it, it'll auto import that module. Uh, if so, let's see what happens when I try to publish this module to this gallery because I'm right now I'm requiring a module that I haven't published anywhere yet, right? And that's the first gotcha is if I go to publish this module, we're gonna get a fun error that tells us that it can't find. It's easier to probably read it here in the green. It basically, it can't find that required module in the repository. So what that means is you have to publish the dependencies first before you publish the ones that it depends on. But the nice thing is if you install from a, or a gallery, uh, it will install those dependencies. So if I actually had both of these modules up there and I do install module, it will install both of them. Now, uh, that's all fun and good, but we have some modules we can't Publish, like the Active Directory tools, right? We gotta 
use the features to add these, like they're not publishable modules. So you can still take dependencies on those. And we're going to dive into this other obscure feature. If we swing way down here into the uh, private data, PS data, there's a property here called external module dependencies. And all this really means is uh, PowerShell get ignore this dependency. So I can actually define it as required, and if I actually put it on here as this, it's an external dependency, uh, PowerShell gets like, okay, I'm not gonna complain when you try to publish this. So here's one way to get around that, of I can now publish this module just by uh, defining this guy as external. So like Active Directory command would be a great one to put there. And if I rerun this publish command, we should happily get our module published. Right, you, so yeah, you still have to make sure it's on your box uh, and install it. And also by doing the external flag, when it does the install, it's not gonna try to discover it and install it at that moment. Like, you have to manage your dependencies when you say they're external uh, uh, with some other mechanism. Okay, so what do we have in here now? We should have both these modules, beautifully. When we get to, but we can also, so right now I've been, pointing to a, to a module, like through the file system, right? Here's the path to this module. But if I have a already installed module, I can just publish it by name. So, if, or if I load it, I can publish it by name. So here I can do get module name watch command. Like this guy is uh, not loaded, but he's already installed in this box. And if I want to publish him, I can just publish him by name. So if I specify the name of this module and hit publish, uh, da -da -da. I'm specifying, I'm specifying the version just in case I had more than one on my box, but in this case I don't. All right, and we do our find. Beautiful, this guy published just like the others. So, but this is where I start thinking, if you've got multiple repositories, uh, if I search for this guy now, I'm gonna get search results both from the PS gallery and my private repository. So here's where things start getting a little tricky if you're not watching what's happening here. So if I try to install this module now, because, well, we want to install it, we're going to complain because, well, here's the error I'm going to get. Uh, it basically found two copies of this module. It found one in the public gallery and one in my local, and it's going to actually fail to install because two were found. It's like, I don't know what to do. It doesn't matter that they both had the same version. So you get two identical modules, if it finds both of them, it's gonna kick back and say, hey, we're not, we're not happy here. So you gotta provide the repository. Now, there is kind of a way around that, and the approach I tend to take is I specify default parameter values. Now if it's in a script, you can hard code your bootstrapping scripts, but like locally, I tend to set my default parameter values so that find module now, this one's optional, but I usually do install module, so it always installs my personal repository first. And if I want it from the public, I then provide dash repository PS gallery. So I can always override these defaults. So, uh, and I also tend to do module scope current user. So like, this guy is always on my profile. And these guys, uh, this guy usually, this guy's hit or miss. Like, it's up to you if you want to be able to, when you hit find, do you want to see the gallery plus yours, or do you just want to see yours, right? And there could be decisions on why you might go down one path or the other. Um, and I will cross that in a moment. Okay, so local to the disk. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna run through doing a new Git feed here. But one of the values of having your own private repository is like you could have it so uh, if you're doing like a, a NuGet feed like say CloudSmith, you could set it up to like cache and pull from the PS gallery to then load locally. Or you could just have this as your curated list. Like my internal gallery is what is curated that my team and my server should use. And if I want them to use it, I will pull it from the gallery in another process and put it in there. And I've actually got scripts running through that specific scenario as well. But yeah, so, uh, so anyway, okay, we're gonna publish to NuGet feed. 
uh, uh, I saw the demo with CloudSmith, and it's probably about as smooth as a feed as possible, but I am just going to use a local dev container here just to keep my demo consistent with what I practiced. Okay, so I've got an API key. Uh, I'll need this when I, when I set up my NuGet feed. So I'm, I'm hand-waving here. I'm saying I'm going to create I'm going to create a Docker container that's a NuGet feed, but this guy gets, stands in place for, you know, like the, uh, uh, the CloudSmith or ProGets or any other feed that you can have NuGet packages in. Um, each one has its own nuances, and you definitely have to test them, but if you can just spin up a Docker container and use that for your, your uh, repository, this is as sim is super simple. Uh, lacks features, but I can publish and pull modules from it like, like nothing else. Okay, so let's, let's stand up this server, this container. Oh, beautiful for control testing. Um, in fact, that's kind of what I also like about being able to have like a, uh, the file system. Like if I want to test my scripts that publish and, and load modules, I can create a folder that's a repository and test all these scripts against a local repository that's not my actual internal repository. And then taking the next step, I want to test against a new feed. Let's start the container. <laughs> uh, all right, let's verify we're live. That went so fast, but I've got a perfect test endpoint right now. This guy is up and healthy. And the way it works is, like, Docker is starting this container that's mapped this port, uh, 5080, so I'm doing local host to talk to this container. Um, but when I actually register it, it's pretty much the same thing. All right, so repository, we just specify the URI instead of the folder path. I'm going to give this guy a different name, my NuGet repository. And, uh-oh, uh-oh, what happened there? Let me check this again. This guy is okay. This guy, oh, he, it might just be a warning. This guy's going to fail because I already registered him. All right. Does he look good? He does. We're going to pretend like everything's fine. We'll see if it works or not. <laughs> okay, so we got a repository. Uh, we do our find. We should get nothing back. Um, yield zero results because we haven't published anything. So same story as before. In fact, and we're just going to publish a quick module to see it all work. And all the stuff I was doing with the file system based repository is effectively working here with uh, this local one. So I publish and I do a get. What is the deal with you? <laughs> well, my module. Publish. I have a love-hate relationship with this module. Uh, da -da -da. Conflict, already published. So it thinks it's there. Mm-hmm. Boy, I probably should have. I probably should have. Okay, let's do a quick cleanup of, ah, no, 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 that's way too much. All right, all right, all right. Uh, da -da -da -da. Well, I'm gonna have to chase this nuance down. Man, if I just had this, do I have a video of this one? I don't think I do. You know what? I will happily give that one a try. Uh, one, two, seven, dot, zero, dot, zero, dot, one. 
this should give me the same OK status. Yeah, that's fine. All right, let's do, uh, is it remove PS repository? Or it's unregister, unregister. Yes, repository. Uh, my excellent. Let's rerun this guy. Get those URIs. And Gotcha. What you're seeing, folks, is Devin saying out loud to show you it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, unregister uh, my new. Excellent. All right, let's give this guy one more shot. And all right, we list it here, and then we jump forward to actually find the module. One last attempt here. Hey, thank you. Okay. One more nuance trap I wasn't aware of. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, I guess I had to blow away. Does that been? Creating and recreating this over and over. I had some leftover artifacts, not in my cleanup script. Uh, I'll have to save that, cache that later. Uh, yes, yes, yes. All right, let's. Oh, oh, no, we already published this module. It was the get finding that it couldn't find. And that's where we were. All right, so we're picking back up, back on track. Da -da -da. Okay, so, and then just to prove we can install, we'll force install from the same. New repository, and then we can see that the module is still in my list of available modules. Perfect. All right, so now let's uh, look at like some of the tooling to publish modules, right? So sometimes you know when the commands work, it's beautiful, and when they don't, things just just uh, get annoying. Okay, I've got a, a, um, a helper function here, step module version from the build helpers module. This is just going to increment the version number of my module so that I can. Um, continue to publish, because I can't republish the same version over top of itself. So that's the magic I'm doing with this line here. So that I'm going from 1.0.0 to like 1.0.0.1. All right, let's make sure our environment is right. Variables are set. So my module, my repository. So I'm back to my file system repository, just to make the uh, rest of the demo go smooth. Uh, all right, so. Uh, when I'm publishing, uh, I like to like 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 thinking like a, either you like a build script or a publish script locally, or you're in a pipeline, like you're in a, you know your DevOps or GitLab. Uh, I like to like list out the files that I'm publishing, right? So right away, um, if I'm publishing to the location, I'm just going to enumerate the files, and this guy's going to be awfully short, but put that in there so when you're debugging later, you know it was supposed to be published. All right. And I, get, and I get very verbose, like, okay, what I'm gonna do next. I like to state what I'm about to do before I do it in my logs. And here, I feel like this is pinched a little bit. All right, so here's the same command we've kind of been running. Um, I'm doing a little bit of magic here where uh, I'm going on, so with, with like a pipelines, like a uh, DevOps pipelines, it's common to put like secrets like injected as environment variables. You know, like uh, Dallas Pipelines has a way to keep them secure so that they're not as um, easily accessible. And many pipelines take that pattern. Uh, you can easily store this into Azure, you know, key vault and, and fetch it more directly. But this is, this is that super common pattern. So I'm pulling my API key from the environment in this case. And then uh, I always force publish true because there are edge cases where uh, 
uh, uh, PSGET does some weird stuff if you don't. I can't even remember what they all are now, but. <sighs> okay, so publish module. Uh, there are stuff that we want to stop, and I always do verbose my pipelines, because man, when the thing doesn't work, you want those details. All right, so this is yeah, the classic publish command, kind of flushed out. So when it goes sideways, uh, uh, here's some things we can troubleshoot. So first off, there's a test module manifest. Uh, this guy is actually ran as part of the publish command. So if you're having issues, cut your problem shooting in half to see is your module actually valid. And, uh, and that way you're not running it from within the publish command, you're getting its output more, more directly and cleanly. So if we do a test on this guy, he's obviously gonna be good, but uh, you can run this command directly on your own. Then, uh, but if that's failing, just go back to basics, right? Remove it from your session and see if you can import the module. Because many things, you know, you can easily break your importing if you didn't realize it and that's gonna make everything fall down. So always make sure that your module is, you know, good and sound before you start trying to troubleshoot the, the PowerShell get modules. Um, uh, another one that's really easy to do is when you're publishing a module is actually publish the folder, not the PSD1. So here, if I actually try to, like the full name here is the full path to my PSD1 of my module, if I try publishing that, um, I'm gonna get a fun little error here that basically tells me don't do that, right? It's gonna say, it's, I mean, at least it's helpful. This is not a valid directory. So, kind of confusing at first when you're trying to publish a module, but modules are, you know, it's a directory of things and the PSM1, PSD1 sit in there. So, if we just do the directory name instead of full name, this same command is gonna publish like expected. Um, all right, then verify your module actually published. Like, uh, I think it's fixed now. Yeah, it is, I got, I, got, I got some links to the GitHub issues if you wanna see the history on some of these nuances. But I, even to this day, uh, I will add a check that makes sure my module was actually published after I run the publish command, right? Close that loop. Um, all right, so I am going to import my PSD1. So this trick here, if you didn't know, the PSD1 is, just a hash table, right? If you look that look, if you open up, it's just a hash table. So I can do invoke expression on it, and I get a hash table in my code to work with, because I want access to that uh, version number, at least in the script. So here I can see all the properties of the uh, module, and specifically the module version. All right, and then just go search for it, and just verify that that doesn't throw any errors, like that is a nice safe check once you've published. Close that loop. Okay, uh, also verify your API key isn't blank. Um, you know, when you're using a pipeline and you're storing your secrets in there, sometimes you have to map stuff in several places and uh, it's not easy to see that your API key is actually getting into your code or not. Uh, the nuance is, when you check for it, don't output the API key to see if it's there. Like that's the nuance, right? We don't want to be like throwing in our logs, here's the secrets to everything. Uh, we gotta check it and then just, you know, be informative, but not so much that uh, we're you know, leaking secrets. And then, excellent, okay. So there's those nuances. Um, so I talk about like re-hosting modules internally. We talk about having, um, uh, right, having that curated list. And that was the environment that we went into where we treated our internal gallery as the list that everything could depend on. So once it was published there, it was live for everything downstream to consume and use and, and it would pull as needed. Uh, and to do that, I'm actually gonna run this real fast. Excellent. Okay, so I've got I'm gonna create a download folder here to work from, because I'm gonna pull modules down. And I defined my rules, what I wanted effectively in this JSON file. So just like a list of modules, you know, the names of the modules I wanna pull. And what's nice about this is if I put it into a pipeline, I just gotta check in the new changes and it will, you know, auto 
manage these modules. So I have three modules in this one. We're going to load the config data and just literally walk through the list and just call save module. So uh, uh, the nice thing about save module, it's the same thing as install module, except you actually tell it what folder to put it in. So, uh, right, so if we hit save module, we actually have locally to our project um, all of those modules downloaded. So this runs, and then we can, uh, let's take a peek at what we got here. So if I check this download folder, yep, all three of those modules downloaded. Perfect. I like to go to the next step and like import all the model, modules, right? Like, are things working? Run the import. Um, if you have tests for all your stuff downstream that depend on these modules, this is where I would run those. Uh, not all projects have tests, right? But if they do, go ahead and run them with the new modules to make sure all your ecosystem is still healthy. Uh, and then we do the same loop as before, calling publish module. So it's really just a data retrieve, double check some stuff, and then publish from one repository to the other. Like this is perfect for like a pipeline type of a, you know, DevOps pipeline. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think I was doing this on demand, but you could easily schedule it to keep stuff fairly, fairly fresh. Um, as this finishes here, uh, actually I'm gonna pop, actually we should see these listed in my internal repository. Excellent, all three of them are there. And it's an old version of Pester, but that's fine. In fact, if I actually hop back into uh, this file, I decided to like pin this version of Pester. So there are times that you wanna pin stuff and you probably should pin more often than you don't. But here's a case where I pinned Pester and I let the other two just grab whatever's latest when this runs. Um, if I, you know, like here if I check the gallery, and I recorded this specific uh, session um, uh, a while back, so it's an older version still. But uh, here I can compare if I check the gallery at the time that there's a difference. So I literally grabbed the specific version and rehost that internally. So, excellent. Well, in a way, that's kind of why you, I, I suppose I was pinning them, right? Like, I, if I say just this one version, I don't have to worry about something else popping in because I, right here. Yeah, so here's, and that's it. Like, if you, if you are floating your versions, you're basically gonna go until it breaks and you go one minus, and then you end up pinning there until you either work through the issues or it's, you know, it, it, it's a better release. Yeah, exactly. In that case here where I'd, yeah, I, I'd, I'd pin it to a specific version until the, the, the new one was actually published and then bounce it to that one and that becomes like your, your, minimum, your, your, minimum, your minimum version in that uh, scenario. And then import tests. All right, so, da -da -da -da. so that's the fun of like, you know, re-hosting. Uh, then the other, uh, whole of nuances is like the bootstrapping, right? Like you're bootstrapping a system to get and pull modules from a gallery kind of like for the first time. It could be a server or a workstation. Uh, this is especially fun because in the beginning there was version 1.0.0.1 of PowerShell Get that actually shipped with Windows. And the weird nuance is that the version of the module actually changed in Windows releases, but they didn't update this version number. <laughs> so, and the parameters, the parameters that you used were different in the releases, so you can't have one set of parameters that you needed that worked for all of them. Uh, long story short, update PowerShell get, very first thing, like this will save so many headaches, is when you're bootstrapping, we update PowerShell get first thing. I don't let anything else happen until I've done that. So. But the other fun with updating the PowerShell get module is that the, it depends on the package manager module in the current version, and that's a binary module, which means you can't import it into the same session you're in. So 
if I need to update this module, I can't use this module in the same session that I'm updating it in, right? So that's annoying for bootstrapping scripts. My dirty little hack is the very, very beginning, I start a job to go update that module and make sure I don't make any calls in my current session that would load the module, right? So if I start the job, let it do the update, and when I come back to my session, I can then do my updates and installs and kind of patch the stuff from there. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you could, uh, you could, but the nuance is like, yeah, if you have a session active, just make sure it doesn't load in the current session. So if, yeah, a, a child process, um, probably like a 4-H parallel might work, different run space, but yeah, as long as uh, uh, you're not getting it to load there. So that's the nuance there. Uh, we have to install the NuGet package provider. Um, I always force install that. It is the first step of setting up a repository. And then we register it. Same command we've been running the whole time. And then we, then I actually, I tend to pull PowerShell get from my internal repository, because that's the version I'm kind of pinning. So I usually have my script reach into my gallery to pull it, uh, do a version check. Here I'm checking for 2.2.5. And then we just do the install of these two. And when it's, what? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then we just wait for that thing to install, and then I can go on and load any other modules I want to load. Because that way, and, and, and the nuance is because you have to put so many parameters. I got to specify dash force and allow clobber and uh, accepts, you know, certain things signing, and that's the things that changed that um, cause your fun nightmares. Uh, one nuance, if you are uh, like an offline environment and you can't reach out to the internet to install the package provider, you just go steal that from another system that's already loaded it of the same um, architecture, you know, Windows version, effectively, and move those files over, and then the import package provider will run. And here's the two locations to look, uh, depending on if you're doing like uh, user versus system uh, imports. And fun, fun, fun. All right, uh, one trick I do is I have one module responsible for like updating all my other modules. Um, uh, part of that is because update module doesn't manage dependencies, it's got its own problems, it doesn't clean up, so I write my own that's gonna do the cleanup. And uh, so one of the first things I do is I install my module manager, and then I call my version of update module, and in that case it looks something like, this here. All right, so update module, and I'm, I tend to be pretty verbose indicating what was updated or what wasn't updated. But here's a case where this, apparently this LDTFS uh, needed updated, and now this server manager is installing, and ran through fine. Um, so I let this guy manage all the logic of updating everything for all of my systems and pieces. I have this module, kind of in its entirety, in here, uh, is bonus content to you know work through and manage it. And, and this is one where I've effectively defined: here's the modules. I'm using like a, a PS gallery for some stuff, and in this case, the internal one. Um, so it's like you either do your curated list of your internal gallery, or you can have your magic module manager say, "Give me this one from the public gallery, and I'll pull these from my internal one." Like. It's up to you as the designer to, to kind of make that call and that decision. Um, I am, yes, trying to see what's the most important things to finish up with here. Oh, so here's like the internals of that logic, right? I can install everything from the internal repo. If you just do name star, you can find module, it loads everything, right? It'll, it'll give you everything. Or here's a scenario where I'm pulling it from like a manifest. Right, just give me the list. Uh, this manifest, I designed these keys to match exactly what you get if you do find module, so I can just pipe this to the install commands. Right, so name, repository, maximum, minimum version are properties on find module. So in a way, I can just swap those two in uh, for each other. All right, and is that? Uh, then I should walk through here some logic on 
uh, doing the, just updating what needs to be updated, right? So I'm, I'm running, I grab my list of modules. Through this logic, um, I, I get the local modules with the same names. So I'm filtering here on like all modules name, walk through each list, find the one, the pairs that match, you know, and if, I, if, if what I want to install doesn't match my local versions, that means I need to install it, uh, we do the install. And then if you actually want to do your own cleanup, this is where you'd clean it up. And I would definitely do the install the new one first and then clean up the old ones after. So you don't get yourself in the hole where you delete all the old ones and then the install fails. <laughs> and leaving the system broke, right? So that's why you can have like an online operation versus a potential downtime scenario. Uh, uh, other nuances I definitely have to call out is that not all version numbers are the same. Uh, thankfully, this is getting better just because of time. But once upon a time, NuGet decided they're going to break the world and ignore all the complaints. There's a fun thread here if you want to want to read it. But if we look at uh, back in the day, the SQL D, the, the DSE modules were the worst offenders, but that's been generally cleaned up. Uh, but what we happen is the trailing zero, right? When I do a find module from the gallery, um, I actually get a module that has you know a four part version number. Last one is a zero. So when this loads here, I can see, uh, yeah. The top one has the zero, but when I republish it internally, uh, NuGet decided, you know what? I'm going to clean that up for you. I'm going to get rid of this extra cruff at the end that you don't need anymore, which means I can't directly compare those two anymore. So thanks, NuGet. <laughs> uh, so. And then, so especially if you're like, if I'm doing logic locally, doing, yeah, if I'm doing logic. So, uh, Really what I'm calling out is, yeah, these two versions, they technically should be the same, but if I actually compare them next to each other, they're false. And if I actually dump these to the shell, uh, the structure of it is that the revision becomes like negative one instead of a zero. Uh, so if you are comparing version numbers and you're dealing with trailing zeros, change your version numbers to not have trailing zeros. That's, that's, that's the solution. But if you gotta deal with it, if you have to deal with it, I got a little snippet of code here that does the comparison. Like, check the major or the major minor builds if they're the same, and then if the revision of both is less than or equal to zero. And that kind of does the logic to account for it. Uh, but like I said, if you can just drop your own trailing zeros on your internal stuff, uh, definitely do it. And the last nuance here is that the version types aren't the same across different commands. So. If I do get module and find module, one gives me a version number and the other one gives me a string. So you gotta make sure you're doing same types when you're doing comparisons and checks. Uh, yeah, that is exactly what I got here. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's good. And that's just to see the pieces fly. All right, yeah, so I do my get module. I, uh, in my local, I reach out to the gallery, give me the PS gallery. And if we check the types here, on the version, I've got a string from the gallery and then a actual version number from the local one. So yeah, fun times all around. <laughs> Feel my pain. All right, so like, but that's, uh, the good news is there is the PowerShell get 3.0. It's still in preview does solve a lot of these problems because they're not depending on package management. They're not, they're doing their own NuGet type stuff. So the, a lot of stuff is hopefully fixed and resolved. Um, but the yeah, most important thing is update PowerShell get right away. And with that, I'll open up to any last minute questions here as we kind of finish off the session. So, yes. You looked at Warren's PS Depends example? I have. Um, yeah, so PS Depends lets you define like in like a, a text file JSON like here's things that my product depends on. And 
it will then like reach out to not only a gallery, but it'll do like a GitHub or other file locations as ways to pull independencies into a project. Um, yeah. Um, three, just do three. <laughs> so, uh, uh, semantic versioning. So four is valid semantic versioning, but in general, I think the three part, right? Like the, the, the breaking changes, the feature releases, and the bug fixes plus stuff. And I think that's a good pattern to run with. I tend to start with 0 0.1.0, uh, rev like mad until your first release, and then, you know, bump stuff up and just be a little more cautious with it. Um, Yes. So, very cool theory to release, to create a pipeline to release all these modules. Do you recommend some, uh, some uh, module or tool like I, I was reading about in both this, for instance? Do you recommend some other? Yeah, so if you're uh, building modules, like so, one pattern is when you're creating a module that you might have like a subfolder full of all your functions for public and private. And best practice is to, when you publish, concatenate all that stuff into one PSM1 for performance and loading reasons, right? So that's where a build step that does that transform comes into handy. Yeah. Um, I cheat, my build step is anything I want to happen before I publish. So I do my unit tests, my script analyzer tests, so I, I make it pretty fat. And then there's two common frameworks, invoke build and Saki, that kind of put some structure around that. They've kind of got their own DSLs. Um, I've used both of them. Um, in fact, I've got a lot of examples uh, out on GitHub with the invoke build for some pretty complex ones. Uh, but, uh, but sometimes you just need some just simple commands. So if your script is super simple, those might be just too heavy. But when you start doing more complicated things of multiple steps, um, start looking at those other, other frameworks. Because they do have some nice features. Especially invoke build, the really star feature, if you're also bringing in like other like C-sharp development, it can be smart and not like rebuild stuff that hasn't changed. So it can actually say, let's rebuild the whole project once, like all my, you know, my, C, my .NET stuff, the, the modules, the manifest, all these things. And then you run it the next time, it could say, oh, this hasn't changed, I'll skip that step, this hasn't changed, I'll skip that step, I just need to do these artifacts, right? So it's got advanced build features um, if you're going down that path. Sorry, yeah. yeah. I've got some good solid examples. I've got, uh, yeah, so if you go to my GitHub, I have, uh, I think my, my actually my uh, PS graph that I demoed in the Lightning demo, I think that's got a good solid set of, of commands. Uh, the Lone Depot repository, where I was publishing modules there, also has a good solid set of invoke build commands. I was in the process of like ripping those out into like a helper module. Like there's these, you go through these phases of, your build scripts get bigger and bigger, and eventually I had more build script code in my projects than I actually had like function code. So I needed to like step back and how do I handle that better? But it is very robust. Uh, we're talking about breaking changes. I've got examples in those projects, both of those projects, that will look for breaking changes from the previous release and bump the appropriate major minor version number for the release. And if we want to do a side discussion on that, um, I'd be happy to walk through and talk through some of those crazy things I was doing. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, do this session in Vals. We really appreciate the speakers. Thank you.